Miami's mighty streak meets Florida's feared swamp. Inside both locker rooms, the quiet, the calm before the hurricane storm and September's best matchup. You come down to cane country, hurricane country, you go home with a whooping. Gators better I let me down. <laughs> That's all I would say. <laughs> brother that's what we go at and you are in the way college game day is presented by discover card proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show a sticky and steamy Saturday in Gainesville. Heavy sense of anticipation. The national title that can wait. So can talk of the Heisman Trophy. It is the state championship of Florida. The inside track, and that is plenty. But of everything, the band ugly and folks ready for the big game day morning here. We welcome you just outside the swamp. Chris Fowler, Lee Corso, Kirk Herbstreet, Tony Barnhart will join us. We thank P.O.D. for getting us all pumped up. You guys, you know, the BCS championship game is only played in the state once every four years. But the road to that national championship game league goes right through this state every year. No question about it, Chris. And I'm looking forward to a matchup of the best college football players in the nation on any field, on any game this year. Features two great quarterbacks, Florida's Rex Grossman, Miami's Ken Dorsey. There's great size in this game. The 17 starting linemen for both teams average. Listen to this, both sides of the ball, 6'5", 293. Kirk, there's skilled athletes that can run and play in every position. This is a National Football League scouts dream oh, game. Oh, it is. Best game of the year, you think? Oh, Man for man? Best athletes. We're going to remember that on October 12th when we're in Dallas watching Texas and Oklahoma. No way. The thing, the thing that I'm looking forward to watching is the mindset of both these football teams. And look at the Miami Hurricanes, defending national champion, on the road for the first time. And they're an underdog. You don't think they're fired up to be an underdog on the road for the first time? And you have the Florida Gators. Can they win the big game without Steve Spurrier? Everybody wants to know it. And both these teams have a lot to prove. The Gators and the Canes want to show that they're for real. You know, it's a scout's dream, except they can't get in. There's no room in the press box. Not a single NFL <laughs> scout here. Ours. I have a special announcement now. Kirk and I have talked about this, Lee. Because LSU, your national championship, yeah. lost before Labor Day. Right. A first team mulligan. You, you duck hooked it off the first tee. Give me a new opponent for Texas in the national title game. The Florida Gators. Really? All right. Oh. That's a popular choice. <laughs> you know, you're not on the spot. Just, hey, you team. only get one mulligan. No, I'm okay. just kidding. This is the only <laughs> top 25 matchup today. The other storylines are going to be following throughout the day and throughout the show. We're going to see if the Fighting Irish can find a little more offense today for that backyard brawl with the Boilermakers and Coach Ty's home opener. Also, the Crimson Tide are playing for pride and each other. It's a clash of Crimson against mighty Oklahoma today in Norman. And reeling Ragon of Louisville visits Duke, where they now cut down the nets and tear down the goalposts. And of course here, Miami brings a 23-game win streak into a reignited rivalry that stands 25-25 all time. Florida always felt Miami needed this series more, and they dropped it after 87. That last regular season meeting was a Miami mugging. Walsh, Irvin, the Blades brothers, Daniel Stubbs, and Randy Shannon. Now the Canes defensive coordinator made a big pick. The only reason they got four points was because our deep snapper snapped the ball over our punter's head twice, and that gave them four points. We knew it was the last game for quite a while, and we wanted to shut them out. We wanted to shut them out. We wanted to send, send them home with their tails tucked and understand you come down to cane country, hurricane country, you go home with a whooping, and that's what they did. They went home with the whooping. Oh, 
Michael, they love you here in Gator country. Another unpleasant Florida memory, the Sugar Bowl a couple years ago. Ernest Graham was the Gators' best weapon. Rex Grossman was a fresh starter in that game. Ken Dorsey started and won it for Miami. D.J. Williams catches a touchdown pass. He was a fullback at that time. He's a linebacker tonight. Now, only six starters on each side were a part of that game. Both head coaches, of course, have moved on to the NFL, but the fresh blood pumped into these programs from this state, a total of 131 players, definitely fuels this thing. National title talk, that can wait. It's very early in the season. The equally important state title inside track is at stake. When we found out we were going to play Florida in the Swamp last year, you know, we actually asked, we thought about that game last year during the season, and, you know, all summer we focused on, you know, this, this is going to be one of those games where the crowd's going to be really hostile and it's going to be one of those environments that it's just going to be crazy. I kind of felt the, the, how big of a rivalry in uh, 2000 when we played them in the Sugar Bowl and, um, you know, we were fighting in the streets back then. I mean, it's a huge rivalry and I think it's a, it's a big game for recruiting. I think the intensity of, of the rivalry, as like I said, it goes back to knowing, you know, they know each other. A lot of them have played against each other. A lot of them have played together. And uh, so it just it makes it for, a, you know, when you know somebody that's involved in it, it makes for, I think, for a much more intense rivalry. There's a legacy of quarterback heroics to live up to in this series. George Meyer, a senior, once beat the Gators with a left-handed touchdown pass. Spurrier once rallied Florida with an upset. And 17 years ago today, Kerwin Bell outdueled Testaverde. Rex Grossman and Ken Dorsey, though, is the best quarterback matchup in this series history and the best you're going to see all season long. Dorsey's record is the envy of every quarterback, 27 and 1. He had a very light workload in the opener. Grossman, of course, he's 16 and 4 as a starter, the all-time passing efficiency leader. These guys, they're on friendly terms. They're not really buddies. They're not really enemies. Yep. Very different personalities. You got Rex, the social free spirit. Just ask anybody here. <laughs> Dorsey is the total homebody. Who do you give the edge? Or can you give an edge? I don't know if you can give, give an edge. I think Rex is maybe more talented physically at this stage, but I think mentally. That's where Ken Dorsey is a ph phenomenal quarterback. His understanding of defenses, his decision-making, and just his ability to manage a football game. And although Kenny had a great year last year, there are some areas where he felt he could improve physically. Put on 10 pounds. He's throwing the ball now with more authority. And he worked hard on balancing the pocket and stepping and throwing. That was an area. You remember the Boston College game last year they would had some problems with? This year you're seeing him step and throw with more authority. Now, there are other quarterbacks in college football like Rex, like Rex Grossman who have a stronger arm, maybe some quarterbacks who are a little bit faster. But as far as the mind and the poise, that's what separates Ken Dorsey. And that, that's what makes him such a great player. Now, this crowd will not get him intimidated at all. It's almost like having an offensive coordinator in the huddle. He's a great quarterback, no question about it. But Florida has a guy that played pretty well on the other side, Rex Grossman. He's setting all kinds of records with touchdown passes. The main reason why, he is a tremendous long ball passer. Now watch Rex here as he sets his feet. He's got good balance and he hits the receiver. Taylor Jacobs in stride, that's an art. Now Taylor Jacobs broke a 33-year Gator record with yards receiving in one game, 246 last week. Now, if Miami double coverage Jacobs, watch and keep your eyes on Carlos Perez, he could have a breakthrough game. Now, today Miami will use what they call the dime defense. That's four linemen, that's one linebacker, and that is six defensive backs. When the Gators see that, watch the automatic draw to Ernest Graham. Now, what the Gators will do, they'll get in the shotgun and makes it look like a pass. But all of a sudden, they slip the ball to number five, Ernest Graham. He's got the best moves he's had since he's been in Florida. He averages 14 yards per yards per game last week. Now. Their offensive balance is sensational. Last week, they ran the ball 38 times. They threw the ball 32 times. Kirk, no matter how good you are, as good as Miami is, when you get balanced like that, you're going to be tough to stop. Yeah, balance is key. Balance is key in this football game. And for Florida, I think their ability to run the football will decide the outcome of the game because everybody wants to talk about Miami's inexperience in the secondary. Well, Miami's goal in this game is to play zone and rely on that defensive front to be able to make plays to win this football game and really negate the inexperience in the secondary. Florida's primary offensive set is the one back, three receivers, and a tight 
tight end. Miami's going to counter that. Lee talked about the dime. I think it's going to be five defensive backs, six men in the box. That's the key, the deep safety. You see him back there. This is to prevent the big play from Rex Grossman. Now, can Miami's two down linemen and the linebackers stop Ernest Graham? Because if they can't, that's where you have a problem. Now Miami's got to make some adjustments, move the nickel back in, play more man-to-man -man coverage, and now you're in one-on-one -on -one situations, and that's where you become vulnerable. Then it comes down to, does Rex Grossman have time to throw? Miami's goal in this whole football game is to win this game with their defensive front. It's the best front in college football. If they can stop Ernest Graham from running with the front alone, they can sit back and play zone coverage. You guys just getting warmed up. We got more X and O touch. Say something now. Arm is your stuff. Just like the quarterbacks, the coaches are far from Floridian in their roots. A couple of ex-DB coaches for Coach Cooper and Larry coach Coker. Cooper, the cradle coach. How often time. can you say this? Neither guy's ever lost a game as a college head coach. It's good. It's for hurting. now, of course, Ron Zook <laughs> has won over the Gator Nation, although those approval ratings fluctuate weekly and wildly after this game tonight, up or down. For the moment, nobody's grumbling about the guy who was once demoted by a Spurrier. And Zook's players have completely bought in. They'll tell you they love his very down-to-earth style. They say it's refreshing. He is moving at his trademark warp speed, completing a long journey, seven colleges, two pro teams, to get back to this, his dream job. This is time to move on. 150 battles, won a bunch of them, and now time to let somebody else captain this big ship for a while. Some coaches are uh, motivated by fear of losing, fear of not being successful. Some people are motivated by, by competition. I would say I love the games, I love to compete. My name is Ron Zook. I'm the head football coach at the University of Florida. John, you're next on 930 The Fox. How could they let Steve Spurrier get away after everything we went through with Charlie Pell? What's a zook anyway? It's kind of the nature of the beast here. You talk about, is there a negative at the University of Florida? Well, one of the things that makes the University of Florida the best job in football is the expectations here. First of all, you know, I'm not Coach Spurrier. I'm not going to be Coach Spurrier. I'm not going to coach like Coach Spurrier. I mean, I have to be Ron Zook, and, and, and that's the way I'm going to be. In that first press conference, I mean, it was important to me that I make people realize that I'm not going to try to be Coach Spurrier. I'm, I'm going to be Ron Zook. I have to do it, you know, Ron Zook's way. And I coach the same now as I did when I was at Orville High School, uh, my first job. And, and, uh, and I coach the same now as I did when I was in the National Football League. So. I think that's one thing that I have to coach how I am and be how I am. And, and uh, I've made the statement that, that I'm Ron Zook, I'm not Coach Burrier. I like moving, I like being able to, I like doing something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rock and roll, here we go. The work ethic that was instilled uh, in my brother, you know, in my family and growing up, I mean, it was, uh, you know, you, you had a job to do, uh, it wasn't going to be easy. You just you got you got to finish the job. You got to get it done. And don't you know you don't worry about the problems that you're going to face. You don't worry about the, the the bumps in the road that you're going to face. You, you figure a way and you get it done. You know, Ron Zook often talks about gaining strength from his family, his big brother who survived combat in Vietnam, and now his dad Pete, who's involved in a struggle that really trivializes football, cancer attacking his liver and his lungs. Pete not able to make it to tonight's game. He was here to see his son, Ron, lead the Gators out for their opener. By all accounts, Zook has done an amazing job of not letting the strain and the agony of that kind of a situation show. Only on the outside. On the inside, he's dying. But I'll tell you what, with his fire and his enthusiasm, old Ron Zook will have these Gators sky high today. But emotion will not win this game alone. They got to have X's and O's. And that's where Ron did a wonderful job of hiring two of the most respected college coordinators in the country. Offensively, Ed Zombreaker is as good as they get. In fact, his quarterback last year, or last year, Byron Leftridge had 38 touchdown passes. Old Rex Grossman had only 34. Now, if you look on the other side, they've got John Thompson, who handles one of the most expensive and uh, difficult <laughs> defenses to stop in the world. They're complex, 3-4, they're moving all over the place. But mark this down, sweetheart. <laughs> Last week, you can forget, Ron Zook's coaching career starts at Florida today. Forget last week. All right. Is this the day where we see that shadow of Spurrier engulf him like you talked about last week? Is this today or is that later? 
the late, we're going to hear that, see that later, maybe. Uh, his, head, his lack of head coaching experience, Ron Zook did the best thing. Lee mentioned the coordinators. He brought in great coordinators. The other thing that he inherited was a, a football team that not only has talent, but has leadership. Rex Grossman at quarterback, Ernest Graham at running back, Taylor Jacobs at receiver. On the other side, Ian Scott, Bam Hardman, Todd Johnson. I mean, he has a veteran football team, and I think that's helped him. And also, the players have bought into his system. Sometimes there's that feeling out period when you have a new coach coming mm -hmm. into a program that's an established winner. Here, right away, these players bought into yep. Ron Zook's system. His career may start today, but please don't tell me it's defined by today, as if a guy's second game suddenly labels no. him and his no, entire no, legacy. We've heard that a lot. But, but if he loses this game and wins the rest, he wins an SEC championship. Is that a terrible year? <laughs> Your career is defined by playing a team that's won 23 in a row? Uh, uh, no, you'll be all right. All right, I'm just saying it. Don't no. get me started on no, that. Don't, don't, right, get don't get me started. Don't get me. Football on ESPN today. Following us, a good one. Texas A&M <laughs> and Pittsburgh. We'll talk much more about that game coming up. And in prime time, South Carolina dealing with the week of distractions. Visits the 0-2 Virginia Cavaliers. A lot more on the Canes and the Gators coming up. Kirk's visit with Ken Dorsey, the ultimate homebody in the glamour capital. And Notre Dame, yeah, the Maryland game was very impressive, but Willingham must beware the historic pitfall of Purdue to start 2-0. Today's show, presented by Discover Card, proud to be the sponsor of College Game Day. If <laughs> you see that big Discover truck rolling down the highway. <laughs> Just pull over. Let it by. No eggs. That is a wide load. Well, if winning an early showdown can give you a big boost to propel you toward your great season, the winner here is going to be in great shape. As for last week, well, just ask Michigan. And now he gets a chance at redemption. 44 yards to win the opener. Troy sends it back. Navarre got it down. The kick is on its way. Long enough. Michigan wins! So they're all pumped up as the Broncos visit the big house. Sandwich between this game and the one at no Washington game and the one at Notre Dame. Wolverines 15-0 against the Mac. Rice got run over by Houston. And today the Spartans 240-pound Dewan Moss will take the Owls to the World Shed. Today at the shoe, the follow-up Kirk to Maurice Claret's monster debut. Well, Maurice got off to a good start for his career game, 175 yards. I think Kent State undersized will load up the line of scrimmage. Look for Craig Krenzel, the quarterback, to have a big day throwing as Ohio State rolls. Next week, Washington State comes in, and a note to the Buckeye fans, the Biltmore is very nice. They have a lovely spa there, but you can pick from many resorts around the Phoenix and Tempe area if you're making your Fiesta Bowl plans right now. <laughs> you kid the Buckeye jamming. fans. That's all right. We yeah, kid them. If there's such a thing as guarded euphoria, that's the mood at Notre Dame right now. They blank Maryland, five field goals and a punt return. The expectations are up, but old-timers are aware that Irish head coaches from Terry Brennan to Bob Davey, even Jerry Faust, won their opener then promptly lost to Purdue. Boilermakers have had two heartbreakers, the last two visits South Bend, a total of three points. But the losing streak is 12. That goes back to the last six Irish head coaches. 28 years. Willingham Mania has things stirred up in South Bend. It's been a big week there. The president visited, and now Shelly Smith visits to set us up on the scene there in South Bend. Shelly, are they just going crazy? Uh, I tell you, Chris, I'm not sure they even knew the president was in town. But they are out in force for Tyrone Willingham. When he was at Stanford, he would meet with five or six of the media who was covering the team and maybe a couple hundred alumni. It's a whole different story here, as you can tell. We followed him around yesterday as he met at a luncheon with more than a thousand people. He taped his own television show. And then he was at a raucous pep rally, all while trying to prepare for his first home game. In January, when I was hired, there were some people that asked questions about the offense. Only a few asked questions about the defense. But the vast majority asked this question. Coach, what are you going to say at the first pep rally? When you say that you have alums that are passionate about football at this university, uh, that's true. But then you have the Subway alums that are passionate. So and it almost takes it to a, another level in terms of their love of this program. Now, Coach Willingham says that by the time he goes through the famous tunnel, he won't even be thinking about that. He'll already be focused on the game. 
However, Chris, he said he was a little nervous because of the many times he's played here as a player and Bender as a visiting coach, but he might go to the wrong sideline. But he said the grounds crew assured him they'd point him in the right direction. Chris. All right, Shelly, that'll be a great scene there in South Bend. The folks will be keeping an eye on that offense. You can see that the production from last year was way up. They held the ball 41 minutes. The one concern they have, only 130 rushing yards. Ryan Grant, Sean Powers, Neal say they're going to get better. Go back to last year, only two offensive touchdowns in the last three games. But it's raves for yep. the defense in the opener, although it will get a lot tougher starting today. Well, Chris, as you've already said, Notre Dame pitched the shutout last week against Maryland. There are two reasons why they did it. First of all, they stuffed the Maryland run. Maryland only got 16 yards rushing. Then they played beautiful pass defense with multiple coverages. The leader was Shane Walton. He played like an All-American cornerback. Here he had three interceptions. Let's watch the first one. Watch his hands on that play. Terrific. On the second interception, watch his jumping ability. Terrific. Number three, watch the quick jump on the ball. Another terrific. Now, today, Notre Dame will use many of those same coverages they did against Maryland. Cover two, one man free. But the Irish only got three sacks last week, so watch them. They're going to put in some secret blitzes up the middle to get that Purdue quarterback. So what I'm saying is this, the Irish blitz, my favorite kicker, Nick Setta, who kicks them all the time, the Irish win number two by a field goal. Thing is, is Notre Dame's defense that good, or are we gonna find out the They're Maryland's good. offense is that bad? You're right, I, I think their defense is good. The thing that stood out to me in the Notre Dame game last week was the play of Carlisle Holiday, their quarterback, new system. He, he ran the offense like he's been in it since uh, high school. It was the first year that he's been able to do that. Now he faces a much better defense in Purdue. Joe Tiller told me this week this is the best and most athletic defense that he has had since he's been in West Lafayette. And I think the Boilermakers' game plan today is force Notre Dame to beat Purdue by somebody else making a play besides Carlisle Holiday, whether it's Arnaz Battle, whether it's the running backs, the tight end. Make somebody else beat you besides the quarterback. And I like Purdue's defense today to go into South Bend and beat Notre Dame. I think Purdue will upset him. Okay. You give Purdue's defense the edge over Notre Dame. Yes, we'll see. We'll talk more about uh, the other big games around the country coming up, and Tony Barnhart will check in. He's going to tell us whether or not these teams, Texas, Nebraska, Tennessee, they've been winning, but do they have reason to be concerned on the young season? And that's coming up, and a lot more on College Game Day from Gainesville. Well, Dave has Paul Schaefer. We've got <laughs> ugly today. <laughs> Keeping the people happy in the commercials. Inside the swamp, that fast track is getting a final touch-up. Our weekly check of the famous alumni on either side. Guys, this is one of your favorite parts of the show. Lawton Shiles, politician, swimmer Tracy Calkins, the great Faye Dunaway, Connie Mack, Billy, back in kind of your era, Forrest Sawyer. <laughs> University of Miami countering with. Diverse crew as well, Gloria Estefan and Bruce Horn. They have a great music school right. down there, as well as The Rock. Other storylines in college football today. Two famous alums from Fresno State in Oregon, David Carr and Joey Harrington, are playing for pay. Lots of them will meet their replacements as the Ducks and the Dogs do battle today. We'll also check in on some old pros, on the contrast of coaching in college and the NFL. Plus, a lot more in this game, including Rexy's plan for combating the Canes' dominant defensive line. He took three sacks and was hit a bunch in this game last year. Duke. Can they extend the winning streak to two after ending a couple of years of misery? Look at Louisville. The Blue Devils now have some confidence in some new goalposts. It's huge to, to get it over with. Now nobody keeps talking about it. Uh, less speculation on, uh, on my future, because I'm sure that was coming at some point in time. To have the students down there and their support was, was awesome. And, and uh, it's, one of those, it's just one of those things that you'll never forget, ever, my entire life. Of course, they are still big underdogs today. Duke, Houston, and Navy busted losing streaks. Today, the two longest current streaks, Tulsa and Wyoming, may end. Arkansas State's given up 96 points in two games. Central Michigan off a 3-8 and eight season. Pretty decent, though, on defense. We have talked about this in college football, the epidemic rush to judgment, both positive and negative, after week one. So we thought we'd bring in Tony Barnhart right now. Tony, you have a very important assignment. You have to separate overreaction from legitimate panic. <laughs> well, good morning, Chris. You know, an old coach once told me that it's 
after one game, it's way too early to start worrying. But that same coach said it's never too early, early to be concerned. And as we went across the country, we saw some real teams with some very real concerns. After getting knocked down 22 times by Kentucky, Louisville quarterback Dave Ragon told me that he was concerned about the blitzing he'll see the rest of this season. Ragon, however, believes he can eventually make teams pay for bringing all that pressure. At Tennessee, Coach Philip Fulmer admitted that he is very concerned about the season-ending injury to linebacker Kevin Burnett. Former called it a huge loss because a lot of Tennessee's defensive plans were built around Burnett's ability to make big plays. At Texas, offensive coordinator Greg Davis said he was concerned that the Longhorns had only 214 yards against North Texas. But Davis also said that after Texas scored on five of its first six possessions, they started working on some things for the future. October 12 and Oklahoma are not that far away. And finally, Nebraska and coach Frank Solich are concerned because four of their 10 touchdowns have been scored by the defense or special teams. The offense was outgained by Troy State and is relying too much on quarterback Jamal Lloyd. Look for more balance against Utah State. Now, guys, if Nebraska's going to be more balanced today, they're going to have to do it without running back Thunder Collins. He was suspended for Troy State last week. He's been suspended for three additional games. Published reports say that Collins traded his tickets for improper benefits. Chris? All right, Tony, thank you. i got a couple other teams in the Big Ten that might want to be concerned today. Dodging road ambushes, Iowa. They've been a terrible road team, 4-21 and 21 the last four years, just 1-4. and four. They're visiting the Red Hawks of Miami, Ohio. And that's the first ever Big Ten team to go in there. And Illinois, wounded off the loss in the opener, is the first Big Ten team to ever play in the state of Mississippi. They play in Hattiesburg against the Golden Eagles, one of my surprise teams. Is Pam Ward, who's going to call the game at noon on ESPN2, has a sneak preview. Pam? Chris, incredibly, for the first time ever, a Big Ten school is playing a football game in the state of Mississippi. The defending Big Ten champ, Illinois Illini, taking on Southern Miss in Hattiesburg. Last week in St. Louis, a slew of missed tackles were one reason why Illinois lost to Missouri in its season opener, 33 to 20. The Illini know they can ill afford to start a season 0 and 2. The headlines in Illinois reflect the frustration there. Ron Turner sticking with Dustin Ward at quarterback. Southern Miss beat Illinois in Champaign five years ago. They'll try to do it again, this time in Hattiesburg. Pam, thank you. The Illini did not look hungry at all no. in that opening loss, and Brandon Lloyd said that today is a true test of character. We'll see what they can come up with. Well, the reason they didn't look hungry is the fact that they won the Big Ten title last year with a 10-2 record. They were playing Missouri of the Big 12, who had a 4-7 and seven record, and they were big favorites, and you guessed it, Missouri beat them. Missouri beat them by two things. One, they stuffed the run, and they ran the football on them. I think Southern Mississippi uses the same formula with a giant fullback named Derek Nix, and I think Southern Mississippi of the Conference USA gets a big win over the Big Ten. Wow, that would be big. That's you know, a big Miami win of Ohio them. last week surprised North Carolina, forcing nine turnovers. I think it's going to be much tougher, even though they're playing at home, to do the same thing to the Iowa Hawkeyes. Kirk Ferentz, their head coach, has rebuilt this Iowa football team on defense, kind of a blue-collar work ethic, and on offense, they've upgraded the athletic ability, especially at quarterback with Brad Banks. Banks, 6'1", about 190 pounds, is an athletic quarterback who can throw the ball very well, either from the pocket or getting to the outside, breaking contain, and showing that he has athletic ability. And, Throw the ball on the run. That's something that they have not had in Iowa in a long time. Now, I agree, Miami of Ohio is a dangerous team. They're coming off a big upset win, but I think that upset maybe wakes up the Iowa Hawkeyes. I think Iowa will go on the road and win big over Miami and Ben Roethlisberger. Big Ten pride. No That's chance right. to overlook in Miami, right? Not in Mississippi. Miami of Ohio, Ron Zook's alma mater, and the cradle of coaches will rock. And if they beat Iowa, the goalposts are coming down right there. We'll talk a lot more about this game. The living and breathing Heisman. We'll see you in December, my friend. Plus, the flap over the flop. Three decades ago, this was the day that really made this rivalry personal. You will lose every time you play the Hurricanes. Hurricanes are champions. You see these things, brother? That's what we go after. And you are in the way.
Traditions, brought to you by the Tostitos Tournament of Champions, the 2001 Miami Hurricanes, or the 1976 Pittsburgh Panthers, who's the best ever. Vote on ESPN.com and you could win a trip to the Tostitos Fiesta Bowl. Way before the Seminoles had a football program and down through the decades, Florida and Miami has always featured bad blood. A famous episode here, Howard Schnellenberger ordering a field goal in the final play, up 28-7. Payback, he says, for his bench being pelted with ice and oranges. But things really first got personal back in 1971. A famous flop that caused a flap much bigger than Brett Favre's flop at the feet of Michael Strahan. Curry Kirkpatrick on the play that still divides the two sides 31 years later. There was no malicious intent. We were just having fun. To humiliate us like that, just to get someone a record I thought was, showed no class at all. Indeed, Florida fun turned into Miami mortification. A Saturday afternoon of Orange Bowl infamy. When the alligators abdicated, the Canes capitulated. A record was broken. Reputation suffered. And with Florida leading Miami 45 to seven, a full-out flop flipped the state into an even more bitter rivalry. We uh, had Miami stopped, and we had a few plays to go to get the ball back so that John Reeves could have a chance to set a national record for passing. We'd stopped them, and they were getting ready to punt with plenty of time left to break the record. And this uh, knucklehead. Assuming you completed a pass. This, this, this knucklehead uh, punt return guy named Harvin Clark catches the punt and runs like 70 yards for a touchdown, you know, hurdles two or three guys. It was wonderful. When did it hit you that, oh my God, we're not, they're gonna get the ball now? As soon as I crossed the goal line. As soon as I crossed the goal line, turned and dropped the ball. <laughs> and ran over to Johnny and I said, buddy, I, I think I screwed it up for you. If I had to do it over again, I'd ask Harvin Clark to fair catch the ball. It would have been the start of it. But uh, he didn't, he ran it back for a touchdown, so we don't have the ball. We kick off to Miami and they start running it four yards here and he had Chuck Foreman and they're going this way and that and we can't get the ball back from them. I called timeout and went over and talked to Coach Dickey and I said, you know, why don't we just let these guys score? In fact, the Florida fans chanted, let them score as Miami drove inside the five, as precious seconds disappeared, as Clark called two more timeouts before finally relented. We all huddled up and I said, all right, we're gonna let them score. But when they hiked the ball, I want everybody just to fall on the ground. They came up with the idea that they would all flop. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was, it looked like somebody had machine gunned them all down. They just, and they were down. I was embarrassed, I was humiliated. Florida had to, uh a really good team at the time, which surprised me. They, they were stooped so low to, to get a record. How many pads, do you remember how the many pads? Two, his two, two uh, uh, passes, as I, as I recall, they were like roll out on a couple out routes. Eight years following the flop, you'd think time would have healed all wounds. Waters under the bridge. Let bygones be bygones, right? Wrong. In 1979, in the midst of his long career in the pros, John Reeves was traded to the Minnesota Vikings. The first time he set foot in the Vikings locker room, he looked across the way and saw his new teammate, Chuck Foreman. There would still be a flap over the flop. I walk in the locker room and Chuck says, there's that slimy gator that they did the flop on us back in the orange bowl. He was a nice guy, but it was a character record. And that's all I can say about it. We were kids and we were having fun and they it keeps, you know, everybody juiced about the Miami, Florida. Hey, we did our part 30 years ago. You can see how they take it personally forever. That wasn't very nice, by the way. Oh. Jumping in that pool, the Gators jumping in the end zone pool for Flipper, the Dolphins mascot. <laughs> hey, another rich part of this rivalry is this guy right here. He played for the Gators in 42, played for Miami in and 46 after his stint in the war. And he's standing right here, 81-year-old Phil Kaplan. He played on both sides. Phil, I was going to ask you who you're rooting for, but I think the hat pretty much gives it away. Why Miami over the Gators? Well, because, you know, I live in Miami, and uh, if I didn't root for Miami, I guess I couldn't go back to Miami. Well, I root for the Gators any time they don't play Miami. We understand. We thank you for joining us today. I want you to be very careful as you leave the stage here. They might not have respect for a distinguished gentleman like yourself in that hat. The next Gator rooting for the Canes, Phil Kaplan. <laughs>
We will come back plenty more on this game on College Game Day. Plus, a couple of guys who are getting ready for Sunday. David Carr will start for the Texans. Joey Arrington will back up for the Lions. But the Bulldogs and the Ducks will battle today in Eugene. And we'll talk about the new quarterbacks. Plus, Bradley Van Pelt. Can he make it three straight for the Rams? They play in the Rose Bowl today. Finder Sunday NFL Countdown with Chris Bourbon and the gang. Joined by Bill Parcells this year, 11 a.m. Eastern on ESPN. They'll no doubt talk about David Carr's debut Sunday night. Fresno, the day one starter against the Cowboys. Joey Harrington will not start for the Lions at Miami. That's probably a very good thing for him. But both will be watching their heir apparent as Fresno State visits Oregon today. Paul Pinnier becomes the first freshman starter at quarterback for Fresno since Trent Dilfer. Jeff Brady still sidelined with a hip injury. The Ducks' Jason Fife, he got rave reviews, exceeding most expectations in game one, except, of course, his own. Shelly Smith on the young gun, stepping in for the superstars who've gone Madden. Paul Pinnegar and Jeff Brady don't exactly have the same superstar status David Carr had at Fresno State. I'm not recognized, you know, yet, you know. Was but, Dave? Uh, oh, my gosh. Dave was a celebrity in this town. Jeff's got another year. I'll be here for four years, so they'll hear new names eventually. And at Oregon, Jason Fife's personality is just a little different from Joey Harrington's. He's kind of made a point to be, uh, be the, the anti-Joey. <laughs> Joey was very excitable. You could see it on his sleeve. He jumped up and pumped his fist and got excited. Uh, Jason is more internally excited, I think. Uh, very hard on himself. Probably tougher than Joey was. It. But each new quarterback has the same role. Stepping into a void left by a first-round draft pick and school legend. The comfort level's there. You know, I, I don't have a whole lot of game experience, but I'm comfortable with my guys. Go out there, you play with them all the time, and yeah, it's just a matter of getting my feet wet, that's all. Jason Fife is a special kind of person. Now, whether he's going to have the magic that Joey had, uh, but I think Jason has that penchant for showing up big in big games. Replacing the magic at Fresno State has been even tougher. To make comparisons between Dave Carr and our other quarterbacks, I don't think it's a fair thing to do. I think each guy has to establish his own personality and his own qualities that are going to make him a leader. It's like, it's something missing because we were so used to having other guys step up, and now we're trying to look to each other, you know, who's going to lead us to next win so it's, it's kind of a big difference you play for pressure situations and uh you know dave left a big hole in the team and paul pinnegar and other guys who i uh, need to fill it both harrington and carr have weighed in with their advice i had the worst first game ever in college football i think i threw four interceptions we lost 42 to something and uh it was rough but i, I just told him to be himself you know one game's not gonna matter harrington delivered his in person at fife's debut have fun play hard Trust your teammates and, and remember what put our program in the position it is right now. He came up to me and kind of gave me a big hug and said, hey, you know, it's your turn now. Have, have fun with it. That's the most important thing. Just go out and do it. Meanwhile, we got a couple of uh, resident Ducks fans in Gator country who always come and visit us. And these guys are truly touched. They know, though, that that Oregon defense is going to get all over Pinnegar. We really has struggled on third down without David Carr. Bernard Berry and his main weapon at receiver is out for this game. And to be fair, Fife has a lot more weapons at his disposal. No question about it. Last week against the SEC Mississippi State team, boy, that Oregon Ducks ran the football well. And what they did then was play action, and Jason Fife threw the ball over the head for three touchdowns. And here's one as you watch him. Kirk, watch this action, right? He, he sets himself. Watch him turn his shoulders. Isn't that nice? He hits oh, Sammy great. Parker with the nice. touchdown pass. Today, old Robbie and John, those two guys down there, going to be real happy because <laughs> I think Oregon's offense beats Fresno State by two touchdowns in beautiful downtown Eugene. It's a nice place if you can find it, Kirk. Well, they got the newly renovated stadium, so now you can see it beyond the, uh, the grass hill. <laughs> I don't know what has to happen for Oregon football to be recognized for more than just a, a team that puts a 15-story billboard in Manhattan every single football season. <laughs> People need to respect Oregon football. In the last eight years, they have the best overall record in the Pac-10. This offense, for the last six years, 
has averaged 36 points a game. That goes back to before Joey Harrington. So I know that's a natural concern. What are we going to do without Joey Harrington? They're going to put in a new quarterback who has a lot of talent, who's going to fit the scheme and has talent around him. Oregon's going to win the Pac-10, and they'll win big today. Okay? Well, so far, they've been able to do what BCS teams like Illinois and Maryland and LSU have not been able to do, break in new quarterbacks. Yeah. But those new quarterbacks of those schools struggled on the road. The difference is Fife doesn't have to play only four road games right. this season. He has a long time exactly. to improve right. before road games against Wazoo and Oregon State, and that is a big, big key. Tonight, UCLA is the last 1A team to take the field as they take on Colorado State already with two upset wins under its belt and hungry after a poll snub. They beat the Buffaloes, and they're still ranked behind Colorado in the polls. And no respect is always a rallying cry for Sonny Lubick. Now, Tab Perry of the Bruins, he tried to sound respectful. He kind of said, well, Colorado State's a nice team, but they're not us. We're not that worried. But kind of a pat on the head for the Rams as they welcome into the Rose Bowl. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, don't I haven't know. played a game. I, I think players from these bigger conferences need to, to need to wake up and realize that teams from smaller conferences are dangerous. We see it every single weekend in college football. Just ask Colorado last week. So Colorado State's going to come into this game. They're not going to have a whole lot of parade All-Americans. What they have is a lot of effort, a lot of enthusiasm and heart. How about this run by Cecil Sapp? That kind of describes the attitude of Colorado State. He went through seven would-be tacklers. And Bradley Van Pelt showing a little moxie. He's turned into a leader. Watch him spike the ball into the Colorado defender, into the head, into the end zone. He's kind of the leader for this team. I, I think this is a potential upset here with Colorado State. The only concern I have is can they do it for a third straight time? That's the only issue because I think, I think UCLA, again, yeah. typical case where they're going to really not appreciate yep. what Colorado State's bringing to the table, and I think the Rams will upset them. You're picking Colorado State. So I just said, yeah, Colorado State. Not so fast, number one, and be, be, listen to this, a belated not so fast for Notre Dame over Purdue. Oh, now, okay. I didn't know you were you picking them. I would have given you a not so fast okay. then. What's Colorado State has a tremendous advantage. It's their third game. This is UCLA's first game. UCLA has a wonderful surprise element for them and a big tight end named Mike Seidman. He will catch the football 6'5", 245, and they will win. They got youthful team, UCLA. They're the youngest football team in the Pac-10. 19 true freshmen and redshirt freshmen will play today. That youthful enthusiasm wins by a touchdown. Right. They got to beat Van Pelt, who is a warrior. But I know you're not condoning spiking that football off no, the that defender's was, no, head. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. 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 no flight. Oh, yeah, that's right. No flight. Yeah. That does not make you that's a leader, spiking no, a ball no, off no. a guy's head. He's better than that. Yeah. Go Bruins. Coming up, more on the Caters <laughs> and the games. It's ugly. is in the house, and that's not a very nice segue. But Larry Coker will join us live. We'll talk about the ball game coming up next. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! That's called the Florida Cup. Not exactly a cup, but it is coveted. It goes to the state champion, a true round robin between the three superpowers in this state. The Seminoles are idle today. Bobby Bowden just sitting back, putting his feet up, and enjoying this ball game. Meanwhile, Larry Coker, of course, will be very busy tonight. He joins us now from an undisclosed location nearby Gainesville. We won't give that away, Coach. Hey, thanks for your time. I want to ask you, obviously, this is a big ball game. You look in your players' eyes, you can see that. But do you sense 100% of the same hunger that they had last year in a quest to repeat for the national championship? Because that's such a big factor besides just the talent factor. Well, Chris, football is such a, such a game of emotion, and I do sense that. I, I don't really sense that we have any complacency on our team. We have a different personality. We've lost some great football players. We know that. But uh, I don't think complacency is a problem. I think we're a hungry football team. I think we're prepared. We're anxious to play a great football team tonight. You guys, despite defending that great streak, if you go back to last season, did struggle in your last couple of true road games. You had to make some narrow escapes, the crazy carom at Boston College surviving at Virginia Tech when they dropped a key pass in the end zone. What about the makeup of this team leads you to believe that they're going to be better prepared for a test much greater than those two tests tonight? Well, I believe we're, we're a veteran team, and of course we've got a veteran quarterback. That always helps. Uh, you've talked about quarterbacks all morning long, and we do have Ken Dorsey, and a veteran player at that position is, is uh, utmost important for this type of football game. And I really believe that uh, with the veteran players we have, and and we know what's at stake and the challenge we have. I, I believe we're up to the task. Now, a lot of coaches would like to have your problems as far as losing talent, but each season is kind of a starting over in some respects. You have a couple of new offensive tackles you have to break in and a rebuilt secondary. Is there a particular area of concern for you tonight, how they're going to respond to this atmosphere? 
Well, there, there is, certainly, because there are new players there. Uh, Carlos Joseph and, and is, is definitely no Bryant McKinney now. He's going to be an exceptional player, but he's young. He doesn't have the experience. I've been very encouraged with our secondary. We're very athletic. We're very fast. Uh, we don't have the experience or the leadership we had, had a year ago, but we're starting to develop that. Uh, hopefully, we've developed enough of it in time, and hopefully, we'll get enough pressure on Rex Grossman to, to sell our young secondary down and give us a, a great uh, feel for the game and opportunity on defense. Coach, you were in the spotlight a year ago. Folks here in Gainesville say the Ron Zook era, he's going to be judged. This game tonight is his litmus test against a team as good as yours. Is that totally unfair or just come with the territory? Well, I think it's probably unfair, but it does come with the territory. Anytime you're in a program like Florida or Miami, and uh, you're going to be judged by the quote-unquote big games, and certainly this is a big game for both of us. And, and uh, I think it is early. I, I think this, if, uh, if we lose this game, our season's not over, and certainly... Uh, if uh, Ron loses this game, uh, Florida's season's not over, and that doesn't mean he's a bad football coach. He's going to win a lot of football games at Florida. Indeed, both teams still have to visit Tennessee. We thank you for your time this morning. Larry Coker is, by the way, 1-0 in the Swamp. It was an assistant at Tulsa a long time ago in a very different kind of Florida team. <laughs> he's glad to have the Hurricanes and not the Golden Hurricanes <laughs> on his side tonight. We appreciate that. Of course, this week is the anniversary of what was to have been one of the wildest college football weekends in the state's history, Washington at Miami, Tennessee at Florida, Georgia Tech at Florida State. Instead, it was a weekend of mourning as the nation stadium sat silent. How can you go out there and cheer when when, when you got, got this many people uh, dead? Volunteers and gators and bulldogs and Tigers, uh, we're all in this thing together now that our country's been attacked. Keep in mind, we're just playing a game, man. You know, that, that's what it is. So with the passage of a year, we revisited the question of how a national tragedy changed perspectives in the community of college football. What a great effect it had on so many people and how supporting each other was the way that we all kind of got through that and became stronger as a country. Um, are all lessons for us to be learned, you know, in our own lives. You put aside race, color, you know, creed, you put all that aside and you come together. And that, that meant a lot to me to see this country come together. And it kind of made you realize that, you know, America is not invincible, you know, that people can get to us and they do and they will. And so it kind of, you know, served to make you realize how precious life is and the freedoms that we protect. Even though it's been almost a year away, I don't think that, the, that anything's lost on, the, on what happened to our country, and hopefully our appreciation won't ever wane. You know, in a weekend like this, it's very easy to forget that important message that Steve Spurrier delivered a year ago at this time, that ultimately we are all... Gators, Canes, Volunteers, Bulldogs, whatever, we all share one very important thing in common. Coming up on College Game Day, much more on Ken Dorsey as Kirk tries to get him out of his apartment and fails. Sock it up on the Dinty Moore. And we'll check in on the coaches who have been both in the pros and the college. College Game Day from Gainesville. A lot more coming up. Sunday NFL Countdown will feature an ex-Gator, Emmett Smith, as he begins his record run, and Randy Moss, who promises he will behave himself this season. All right. Heather's storyline still ahead on this college football Saturday. We're going to tell you why Bama's offense has the Sooners defensive staff very concerned today. Plus, we're going to chew on the game plan for the Gators and the Kings. Step one of that state championship round robin tournament. Meanwhile, it's been a very difficult week at South Carolina. Lou Holtz has taken great offense to media reports that NCAA investigators have been to Columbia to look into some illegal benefits that may have been received by the ex-running back Derek Watson. He was angry. He was upset. Lee, I know he's been yeah. dealing with a lot of things in his career. He can handle stuff like this, but it's not easy when you go in the road and take on a Virginia team that is desperate to win at 0-2. Yeah, but Lou has the experience to handle it. All right. Mark my words. Okay. He improvises it just as well as anybody in the country. Now, based on their personnel, South Carolina must run the ball success successfully to beat anybody this year, and that includes Virginia today. Now, today, watch South Carolina use the Oakland Raiders philosophy. Run the football, run the football, play action over the top, 
and I think South Carolina wins a close one at Virginia. Oakland Raiders. Yes, sir. Going back old school, Kenny Raiders, Stabler too. style. Al Groh is in the process right now rebuilding the Virginia football program. It's a young team. They start six freshmen on the defensive side, so they really can't match up physically. In their first two games, they've averaged nearly 600 yards. They've allowed 600 yards on the ground alone. So today, they're going to get more of the same. I think South Carolina agree with Lee. They're going to run the football right at him. Andrew Pinnock is one of the bigger backs you're going to find in the country. Out of the SEC, a little over 6 feet, 260 pounds. And he runs extremely hard. So those young freshmen, if they think they've seen something in their first two games, get ready because Pinnock, I think, will have a big game. The distractions could be a factor early, maybe to keep it close. Virginia playing at home emotionally will be fired up to get their first win. But eventually, the running game at South Carolina wins this game. Yep. Yeah, the Cavaliers don't want our pity, but it's almost unfair. you got Cecil Sapp of CSU, Greg Jones of Florida State, who's just a monster, and now Pinnock, three of the three biggest, nastiest stuff. backs yeah. against a very young defense. Right. You know, Holtz and Groh are two of the eight 1A head coaches. We're also head coaches in the NFL. Only Groh has a better winning percentage in the NFL than he had in college. Of course, it's going to be tough for Steve Spurry to equal his winning percentage <laughs> down here at the Redskins unless he has a monster career. Coaching college kids versus millionaires. Here's the scoop from the experts. Professional football is excellent. I think you don't have to have the hassle of recruiting. You don't have to worry about academics. But in college football, you really have a chance to be significant, not just successful. If you're doing your job as a teacher, as an educator, you're really, you're really impacting their lives. You're really impacting a college player's life. Happiness is sometimes more important than the, that ego trip or someone thinking, well, this level or that next level is the utopia. Well, that's not the case uh, and, and for a lot of people. What we want is going to take all of our energy. Everybody wants to coach in a Super Bowl game in the National Football League. Uh, everybody does. That's a goal that any player or coach should have, and that's fine, but it's not really a realistic goal. The only thing I miss about it is, is that you know you're at the highest level of competition. Now I just transferred to here, and you know, we're the same standard. We got the toughest schedule in America, so we're, it's, the, the level of competition is as high as it can get. There's nothing like being associated with a group of young men that are coming at 17, 18 years of age. You spend four and five years with them, seeing them mature and develop and become productive citizens and good kids, regardless of how many tackles they make or how many touchdowns they score, how many balls they catch. It's a different game. And it takes a different person to coach that. Lee, you've coached college kids and not millionaires in the USFL, but <laughs> thousandaires. Well, Chris, uh, you know, I was a football coach in a pros for only two years with the United States Football League. One thing, I was a head coach in college for 15 years, but I found two significant differences in the professional jobs. Number one, in college, the players play for you. In the pros, you work for the players. If there's a problem, the coach is gone. Number two, I found pro football coaching to be very, very boring. It was football in the morning, football in the afternoon, football at night, day in and day out, with very little contact with the outside world. I found it very boring and not very gratifying. You enjoyed those booster speeches and all that stuff that you <laughs> yeah, got to do that the NFL yes, coaches don't I have did. to do. We're going to come back, folks, here chomping at the bit to see who you guys are going to pick in this big ball game. And also the other big ball game, Dan and Norman, Alabama, their seniors are sticking together in tough times, but tough times, what they might face today against that rabid Oklahoma defense. The collision of Crimson is coming up next. College Game Day is presented by Discover Card, proud sponsor of college football's premier pregame show. A reminder about college football on ESPN2 today, Illinois. The game we talked about at Southern Miss on noon Eastern. Stanford and BC at 3.30. And North Carolina wounded off the home loss visits. Syracuse equally wounded in prime time. Following game day at noon on ESPN, Texas A&M and Pittsburgh. A couple teams flying a little bit low under the radar that believe they are a lot better than they're being given credit for right now. The Aggies have another point to prove. On the road, just six and seven in road openers under R.C. Slocum. Mark Jones sets the scene from the Steel City. Mark. Some Pittsburgh Panther fans arriving via ferry in the Ohio River. As for the players, Walt Harris, the head coach, leading the team in the Panther Walk, the latest peg in the ladder of tradition they're building. Of course, this is an area built on steely resolve when it comes to football. Mark, it's very appropriate that this game is being played at Heinz Field. 
the home of the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Pittsburgh Steelers are known as an attacking, blitzing defense. So is the University of Pittsburgh. They were seventh in the nation last year in total defense. They plan on building on those statistics this year. And when you talk about Texas A&M, you talk about Ty Warren, this guy on the defensive front. They have a rich history of successful defenses. R.C. Slocum has been at Texas A&M 30 years. He sees some great defenses. This year's edition of the Wrecking Crew may be their best. They have an outstanding secondary. As always, they have a lot of speed up front. And one thing you know, they have a lot of great athletes on that field. The Aggie color guard poised and ready for the task at hand. Guys? Aggies have an old quarterback. Panthers have a young one, but both have quarterback concerns, both teams. You realize the Pittsburgh Panthers have the second longest winning streak in college football coming into this game today at seven. It's, it's at seven, but still, it's the second longest in the country. They're coming into this game with a lot of confidence because of the way they ended last year, and they're going to need every bit of it. You just heard Bob Davey talk about Texas A&M and their defense, their tradition. It's all about pressure. It's all about attacking quarterbacks, and they have the guys to do it. Not only Ty Warren, but Jared Penwright. Ten sacks last year. He comes off the edge. Kind of the typical outside linebacker for the Aggies. Got great speed, and he can apply what you need to put on a quarterback. And he's facing an offense that is a pro-style system. Walt Harris loves to have a quarterback who can sit back there, make decisions, and pick apart a defense. I think right now his quarterback, Rod Rutherford, is very athletic, but I don't think he's ready to face this kind of defense even at home. I like Texas A&M. I like them all year, but I think they're going to get a big win on the road today. Nice pick, partner. Thanks. Nice buddy. pick. Thanks. Now, I want to look at this team from a defensive standpoint, Pitt and Texas A&M. Boy, they blitz a lot. Last week they forced 15 turnovers by their opponents now remember one situation here Texas A&M does not throw the ball well I think they throw it better today and win by a touchdown but here's an interesting note mark it down watch for a sensational quarterback named Reggie McNeil to come in for Texas A&M this guy is a sensational player watch him going to yank Mark Ferris. Hey, he might if they don't get some touchdowns he was a Pirates draft pick eight years ago he finally makes it to Pittsburgh but in a different sport. And you say he gets the hook. <laughs> yeah. He might. Now to the Crimson Collision, only the third ever. Between them, Alabama and Oklahoma have 19 national championships. Of course, this tied team is not eligible for any championship, but that's a devastating blow to the seniors whose wild careers have featured some glorious yins and some nasty yangs. Beat Florida, win the SEC. Next year, lose to Central Florida and go 3-8. and eight. Create hope for this season with a strong finish and a win over Auburn, and then get slapped with some serious sanctions, 21 scholarships, and a two-year postseason ban. Reese Davis found the pride of the Tide seniors, gives them hope, though, for a happy ending. Probably the most difficult day in my coaching career was telling these players what we were facing. It just destroyed us, and uh, we were we were so hurt for so long because it was like, you know, we didn't do anything. Just dismay, I think, is, is the best way to say it. Not believing it for the first few days, and then kind of coming to grips with it and saying, All right, what can we do about it? Then his friend Joni admits motivating a team that seemingly has nothing to play for is one of the most difficult coaching tasks he's ever faced. So he's come up with an unusual slogan to rally the tide. I don't care. I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. And that's, that's the attitude you have to have. Uh, you know, so many people try to make football so much more than what it is, but it's about Saturdays. It's about lining up, beating that guy on the other side of the ball, playing within those lines. We don't care about the things we can't control. Can't control the weather Saturday. Can't control what has happened with previous coaches or uh, problems in the past. Uh, we have no control over that. We do have control over our preparation, our performance, and we have to focus on that. And after that, I don't care. But his players did care enough not to walk away. NCAA rules would have allowed Bama's juniors and seniors to transfer to another school and be eligible immediately. But all 38 of the upperclassmen stayed put. I can honestly say I don't, I don't, I don't ever think it crossed anybody's mind. You know, it's the question of what do we do now might have crossed people's mind, but leaving was never an option. They love the tradition that they play for, and they want to be a part of the history that happens here at Alabama, and they know that they will be a part of it. Championship legacy at Alabama is literally cemented in the heart of campus at Denny Chimes. This is where the legends from Joe Namath to Derek Thomas to Sean Alexander leave their footprints in the cement. 
at a school that claims 12 national championships, even winning titles, can seem much more like following established footsteps rather than leaving your own. This group of Crimson Tide players believes it can be unique. If you win a SEC championship, you're just another, you know, just another year on the board, you know. And uh, if you're a team who's who can't go to a bowl game, who has, you know, has you know some some things set in front of them, that they have to work around some obstacles to work around. And you fight through that and succeed, and people are going to remember you. And that's one good thing that this team has an opportunity to do. We have an opportunity to write history, to turn this program around, and get it going in the right direction. When a lot of people say no SEC championship. No, no bowl game, what, what, what do you have to play for? And the answer is each other. That's great to see. They will need that togetherness today in Norman to get out with a victory. Also need better special teams play and better poise on offense. Oh, in the yeah. opener, he had four false starts, two illegal formations, and a holding. That was at a home game. Oh, that's amazing. Let me tell you something about Alabama. Alabama's playing this game in Norman, Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a big favorite over Alabama. Alabama is playing against Oklahoma's best defense in the country, so they got one choice to make offensively. Attack them, Tide. Attack them. Now, watch the Tide. They'll try to steal a touchdown early by going deep versus man-for-man -man coverage. Tyler Watts, number 14, can throw it. Then they'll automatic against the inside blitz of Oklahoma and try to get to the outside by sealing off the inside. Oklahoma is a big favorite. They will struggle in this game. They'll win it because I don't think they think Alabama's as good as they are. I think Alabama's a lot better. They're going to give them respect for us. So I think the game is closer than the experts think. Well, that offense you're talking about, because of the different variations of the option attack of Dennis Franchione's offense, has Mike Stoops up late at night all week preparing to try to slow down the option and the play action off of that. Now, on the other side of the ball, everybody wants to know what we're going to see from Oklahoma's offense. And sure, they started off slow against Tulsa. But just looking at some of the consistencies, I think you can see that this offense has a chance to be a lot better. They're trying to get the ball all thrown downfield vertically and they have backs in the backfield i think they're going to have a very good year running the football quentin griffin's been around for it seems like 20 years and here's the future kiwan jones 5'9 190 pounds he's got a tremendous power now we've been talking about it being banned from postseason play will keep alabama in this game this is their national title but eventually in the second half oklahoma pulls away they're going to win by two touchdowns i like bam i like oklahoma to win big Depth is going to be a factor in that second half. The heat index is going to be well over 100 in Norman, 96 degrees on the Can thermometer like this? alone. Yo, this makes this place seem cool. <laughs> yeah. Don't ever say that. Coming up, no. much more on the war that has alums on both sides woofing. Good now, physical man. Man, we're a physical ball club. We like to run the ball.